<laughs> How are you guys doing today? <laughs> it, uh, it is truly an honor to be before you guys. Um, I have racked my brain and prayed and fasted and prayed some more um, just for God to be able to fill me so that I can give you this message today. I want to honor first my Heavenly Father. Um, Lord knows that I would not be here without him. Um, and I just thank God for placing me in this place. Um, despite everything that I've done, everything that I've been through, every insecurity and doubt that I've had, he still saw fit to place me here. And I'm very grateful. Um, even when I don't really feel grateful, <laughs> I truly am. So, um, I want to give honor to my husband, um, the head of this house, the head of my house, uh, my pastor, uh, my friend, my everything. He, um, he truly pushes me out of who I am, who I think that I am, and pushes me into the calling that God has placed on my life. So I'm very grateful for you. Um, to Words Way, um, I thank you for just being here today, just to hear little old me talk. Um, but I, I, I'm so grateful for, um, also my mother. I really can't go on without saying thank you to her because every, the woman that I am today is because of her, because of her strength, because of her determination, um, because of her resiliency to keep pushing. Um, I am who I am and I'm, I thank you for building that inside of me. Um, I thank you for that. Um, dear Heavenly Father, I just thank you. I praise your holy name. I pray, the Holy Spirit, that you increase and that I decrease. Father God, I pray that you just allow your people to see you, to see this world, to see ourselves and each other as you see us. In the name of Jesus, I pray these things and I thank you. Amen. So, guys, um, many of you know my husband. Anybody who knows my husband knows that he's like a visionary. He's, he sees things, he, he creates things in his mind, and when he gets this picture in his mind, he, nothing else really matters in that moment. He, he sets out, he's researching, he's um, YouTubing and Facebooking and Googling, like anything that he has in his mind to get this picture out to manifest itself before, you know, before him. Um, he's, he's truly a car guy, so when he, has a car in mind, he, he sees the car that he wants, he goes shopping and researching, and before he even gets the car, he has the wheels, and he has the floor mats, and he has the decals. He's even picked out the air freshener before he's got the car, but nevertheless, when he gets the car, he pieces it together, and there is everything that he created in his mind. Um, when it came to this church, um, we started in our living room, and um, we were praying you know, for God to give us more space. Because I was teaching y'all babies in the garage. But, you know, glory to God. Um, but anyway, so we were praying to God for more space. And before we even got the space, you know, he started researching. He had the speakers. He had um, the lights. And, you know, they found the cameras and everything that we would need to begin um, ministering to you guys in this building before it actually manifested. So once we actually got the building, we literally had it set up in what three to five days, <laughs> and and it it's crazy to me even even what God has placed in His mind for what's next. Believe me when I tell y'all that He already has an Amazon cart full of stuff ready to go. <laughs> so like in in the the idea of this, I used to think that He was crazy. Like what? Like who does that? Like who just like who does that? But I've I've learned to appreciate the beauty in it because when you are creating something in your mind, the, the idea to just stick to that thing and the idea that you have what's in your mind comes out um, and the discipline to be able to stick with it, the faith that, that goes with it. And, and I've learned to appreciate this gift that I know is from God. Um, I, I truly believe that that is a gift from God and I truly believe that is one of the reasons, one of the many reasons that God has chosen him to lead Word's Way because he knew that um, he placed a vision on the inside of you that was much bigger than anything that you could do on your own. 
but he knew that you would throw away your will. He knew that you would throw away your vision of what you have planned for yourself. He knew that you would give away your money, give away your time. You would dedicate yourself to this thing and you would stick with it. You would, excuse me, he knew that you would give up anything that it took just to say that you were obedient to what the vision that he placed in your mind, your family, your marriage, anything that God wanted, you were willing to give it back to him because of that vision that he placed on the inside of you. And when we do this, this is what God has called us all to do. God has a vision for each of us um, in, in, his, in his creation. He has a vision. He, <laughs> he has an Amazon cart with our name on it. Um, so when we begin to think about this, he, when I begin to think about this, I thought about God like on a much grander fashion than what my husband does. But, um, God is our creator. He created us and he has this Amazon cart with our name on it, full of things that he wants to bless us with, full of things that he's already ordained for us. Um, Psalms 139 says, your eyes saw my unformed body. All my days were written in your book and ordained for me before one of them came to be. Imagine that. Ima just imagine that. And I want to just put a pin right here to just say that, yes, even an embryo, even a fetus that is on the inside of you matters to God. It does not matter when we think or when science tells us that a life has formed. God says he ordained the days before it was even formed. So it matters whether you believe it or whether I believe it. The Bible says that it matters, that God has already ordained these days. So what I want you guys to understand is what is for us is already written. But in the same, in the same sense, I believe that it takes our participation in order to get God to, to check those things out of his Amazon cart for them to begin to manifest in our lives. So, of course, we know that when we are saved, um, Jesus Christ, our salvation is a completely free gift. There's nothing that we can do to earn that. It's all for the free free. So once you're saved, you're saved and you are um, you have a place in eternity in the kingdom of God. But and there's nothing like I said, there's nothing that you can do to earn that. But how we govern our life according to God's principles is what determines how we live on this earth. It determines how much of that Amazon cart God is able to empty out and rain down on our lives. So every time we take a step in obedience, um, opposite of culture, opposite of our flesh, opposite of what our own experiences tell us that we're capable of, and we begin to put God first. We get to see God move. We get to feel his presence in our life. And we begin to see everything that God has already ordained manifest before us. So I want, um, I want to take it back up, you know, to the participation part, because this is the part that a lot of people kind of tap out at. This is the part that a lot of people um, decide that uh, I, I'm good on that. Um, this is the part that a lot of us, walk around blindly, seeing with our natural eyes, but never really tapping into the kingdom vision that God has for our life. So this is what I want to help us see today. Um, Pastor Jordan and even Pastor Calvin kind of mentioned it today, um, just getting what God has for us. You know, like he has these things for us, so it's up to us at this point past our salvation to actually obtain these things, for, to actually see these things manifest in our life. So um, my objective today is to help the believer, those of us who have already accepted Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, to line up our vision with God's vision so that we can truly live a kingdom life, a kingdom man and a kingdom woman. If that's what we're going to call ourselves, we have to be able to live according to the principles that God has set out for his kingdom. So, excuse me, y'all. Um, so for today, my topic is shifting your field of vision. Um, turn with me to Matthew 6, 22 and 23. Let me know when you guys get it. Say amen, please. My mouth is so dry up here. I don't think I've done this much talking in a long time. 
Um, so Matthew 6, 23 and 23, or I'm sorry, 22 and 23 says, um, your eyes, your eye is like a lamp that provides light for your body. When your eye is healthy, your whole body is filled with light. But when your eye is unhealthy, your whole body is filled with darkness. And if the light you think you have is already darkness, how deep that darkness is. Um, that was from the NLT version. And I want to just read um, the Amplified version as well, because I like this one because it just gets a little bit more into the wording of, of scripture. So um, 22 says, the eye of the lamp is the body. So if your eye is clear, spiritually perspective, your whole body will be full of light benefiting from God's precepts. But if your eye is bad, spiritually blind, your whole body will be full of darkness, devoid of God's precepts. So if the very light inside of you, your inner self, your heart, your conscience is darkness, how great and terrible is the darkness? You guys can have your seats. Thank you. So when we when I look at the context of this, this is coming from the Sermon on the Mount, um, a sermon that Jesus did for his followers. It was a dynamic sermon that kind of outlines the kingdom of God here on earth. Um, when we look at chapter five, I believe that it goes really in depth with the character of kingdom men and women. If you want to operate as a kingdom men or women, this should be your character. Um, it goes on in chapter six to talk about the impact that kingdom men and women should have on the earth, that we are the salt of the world, that we are the light um, in, in this dark place. So when you continue to read in chapter six and get to 20, um, 22, it's actually referring to money or possessions. But what I've realized is that money is not the only idol that we have in this world. Um, money is a great one, but there are many other things that keep our eye off of God, it, that we keep our focus on and keep God in our peripheral view. Um, so what I want to help us do is switch that thing to put God in the center view and everything else in the peripheral. Um, so the first thing that we have to do is get an eye exam, right? So when we're trying to shift our field of vision, when we have blurred vision or we can't really see, we go to the doctor and we get an eye exam. So um, if we want to begin to shift our vision spiritually, we have to be able to see clearly and examine what our eyes are actually looking at or what our focus actually is. So naturally, um, what we see, excuse me, naturally what we see, uh, or naturally the function of the eye, I'm sorry, the function of the eye is to take light and translate it into images in our brain. So we see something, it goes through these layers of our eye, projects itself to the brain, and that's how we actually have an image in front of us. Um, Spiritually, though, if we read this scripture, it says that the source in which our body receives light is through the eye. The eye is the lamp of the body. So I have two questions for you. What are you focusing on and how much light are you letting in? So when we see what we see naturally affects how we move, how we operate, how we feel, how we think. If you see a ball being thrown in your direction, you're going to dodge it. You're going to duck. Um, if you see somebody that you know walk into a room, your emotions are going to react based on who that person is to you. If it's somebody that you love, your mom, your dad, your husband, your wife, you'll get excited. You'll feel all giddy and smiley and butterflies on the inside. But if it's somebody that you don't like, you probably want to turn the other way. You'll be sad or frustrated depending on what they did to you. Um, but what we have to realize when we are actually operating in kingdom is that it doesn't really matter what our eyes see. What matters is what God says about that thing. So when we see somebody walk into a room that we don't really care for, what does God say? Do we turn the other way and act like we don't see them? Do we whisper to our friend and laugh because somebody that we don't like just walked in the room? Or do we actually operate in love? and greet them and, and, and hug them. You know, what are we doing with the things that we're seeing when we're actually walking kingdom? 
So I believe that um, in order to operate in this way, we have to really know what God is saying. So that means we have to know the truth. And the truth comes through the Bible. It comes through scripture. It comes through reading the word of God um, because that is the truth. Jesus says, I am the way, I am the truth, and I am the light. So everything that we see, everything that we feel, everything that we are doing has to operate through Jesus, which is the filter on our eyes, um, which has to be the filter on our eyes. I'm sorry. Um, so how much light are you letting in? One way to govern our reactions, our senses, our thoughts is to, um, like I said, open your Bible and just grow in this relationship with God. In order to know a person, you have to sit with them. You have to dwell with them. You have to study them. You know, you have to get up close and personal with them. Um, what I've learned is that God's love language is actually personal time, you know, intimate time, that that one-on-one -on -one bonding time. That's God's love language. So that's how we are able to operate and get to know our God better by spending time with him and spending time in his word. Um, so how much light are you letting in? How much time are you spending in the Bible? How much time are you praying? How much time are you studying? How much time are you actually getting to know your Lord and Savior, the person who saved you, the person who has delivered you, the person who wants to know who you are, or who created you? Um, so the eye is the picture. Can we get the picture of the eye up there for me? So the eye, as I said, the function of the eye is to filter light continuously and instantly to give us sight. But as we see here, there are layers on the eye. So um, we see the, the image of the eye, of the light going through the eye. And the first layer comes to the cornea. The second layer that we see is the pupil and the lens. So as I was studying this, as I was studying this, I got an image. Oh, thank you. As I was studying this, I got this, you know, thought that when we see things through our own lenses, our first layer that we um, that we filter our light through is ex our experience. Um, what, how we were treated, how we grew up, what our parents said to us, the religion that we were raised in, like all of these things are going to be the first filter of the the light that is either reflecting the light or allowing the light to come through or our experiences. And the second filter that we see is going to be our perception, um, how we see these things, how we perceive them in our mind, how our mind is actually playing them out. Um, I heard, um, I heard pastor Dar Darius Daniels talk about, um, when we're hearing something like we can hear something over here, you can say, okay, well, the job has been filled today, and what you take away from it is, oh, they don't want me to work here. Come on, man. Come on. That's not what was said. Yeah. And that's the same thing that our eyes do. We take it through one way, but our perception puts it in our, in our brain as something completely different. So in order to be able to filter these things, um, we need to change what our perception and our experience is. We need to govern ourselves with the light that it's shining through is now Jesus. But what we have to do is put on a lens um, because our, our eyes are blurry. Our eyes are cloudy. We spiritually have cataracts. We can't see clearly because of sin, because of our experience, because of our perception. We just can't see clearly. So spiritually, we all have cataracts. But in order to clear our vision, we're going to have to put some glasses on, some some a different set of lens. So my second point is that, yeah, that's the picture of the class. That's what our eyes see spiritually. That's what a person with cataracts, that's what they see when they look out. And that's what we see spiritually because of all the sin that's clouded our vision um, because of all of our experiences and our perception. So now we need God's lens to filter um, what we're seeing. So... When we live life through God's lenses, what we have to do is walk in a state of dependency completely on God, which means that we have to get rid of everything that has told us what we are, everything that's made us who we are, everything that has built us to be who we are. 
Um, we have to get rid of that and we have to replace it with what God says that we are. We have to replace it with what God sees when he looks through his lenses. So for me, I call it emptying myself out. And this is a process that I've been working on because all of us are going to be working on this process forever. But it's something that has hit me really, really hard lately of just emptying myself out, emptying myself of my feelings and emptying myself of my preconceived notions and emptying myself out so that I can clearly see a thing for how God sees it and operate according to how God is seeing it instead of how I see it, whether it's a selfish thing or whether I'm hurt by it or whether it makes me happy. You know, like those are the things that we have to do if we want to see these things as God sees them and operate in that way in order to be able to manifest what God has ordained for us in our own life. So um, when our heart is truly when our heart is truly set on ridding ourselves of our own selfish desires and replacing them with God, we can no longer lean on anything that once supported us um, when we were walking in darkness. So we can't lean on the things that we wallowed in. We can't depend on those things any longer. We have to truly depend on God and we have to be desperate for his way of life. We have to be desperate for doing things according to the way that he has called us to do them. We have to be desperate, meaning that we, I, I told someone once, like when I'm, I'm emotional, I get emotional and I cry a lot, but I often hold my feelings in. So when, when that buildup comes, it's a great burst. Like it's, it, it's, it's big, but even then I still have to control myself so that I'm not acting out in anger or fear or doubt or anything like that. So what I often do, I go to my bed, I get on my knees, and crying is my release. So I'm crying out to God, begging him to take these things from me because I don't know what to do with it. I don't know what to do with the fear that I'm feeling. I don't know what to do with this feeling of self-doubt. I don't know what to do with this feeling of not feeling worthy enough to be in this place right now. I don't know what to do with these feelings. So therefore, I have to give them back to you because you're the one who gave me feelings in the first place. So Lord, you have to help me figure this out. This is what I have to do to devoid myself of anything that I have preconceived about what I'm feeling. Because if I wallow in my own feelings, to be serious, honest y'all, I wouldn't be up here. You know, like if, if I wallowed in my own feelings, I probably wouldn't be married anymore. Like these are the things that, that we have to rid ourselves of. Even, even speaking on my marriage, like when we first started this thing, it, it was rough in the beginning, but we decided to lean on to God for everything that we needed. We decided to lean on to God for our fulfillment, even though as husband and wife, we are to, to, to die to ourselves daily and fulfill each other. But there's no way in this world that a person can fill you like God can. So that's who we rely on for that feeling. And when you come to that notion that, OK, God, I'm in this situation, but I'm not fully fulfilled. I need you to fill me so that I can continue to pour myself out. I need you to fill me so that I won't be looking to my husband as if he's not good enough because he's more than enough. You said that he was more than enough. So we, who are we to look at our spouse to say that you are not fulfilling me? Because it's not his purpose. It's God's job to fulfill you. So these are the things that we have to work through when we are really trying to walk kingdom. When we're really trying to get that thing out of our head, out of our mind to say, okay, God, I'm going to trust you. I'm going to depend on you. You have to guide my steps. You have to lead me and you have to help me see this thing. How you see, um, there are so many things that God has for us. Y'all like there are doctors in here. There are lawyers in here. There are women who are supposed to write books. There are women who are supposed to run five fortune 500 companies and men too. Let me not leave y'all out. Y'all, you know, y'all, God got a lot of stuff for y'all playing too, but it's <laughs> focusing on women because it's women's month. I think a lot of times we just see ourselves as this insignificant being, but it's not true because God created us wonderfully. He created us beautifully and fearfully. Like he created something and ordained it before we were even born. So what God has for you 
is waiting for you. He's waiting for you to walk in obedience. He's waiting for you to say yes to him. He's waiting for you to push your thoughts and your feelings and your emotions to the side and adopt what he is feeling so that you can see exactly what he said that he, you already are. So I, I love it because as, as I was reading or thinking about the idea of emptying myself out, um, I thought about the greatest example of this is Paul in the Bible, at least in my opinion. So God took Paul's vision for three days. And when vision was restored, he was a completely different man. He saw things from God's perspective instead of the way that he used to operate and the way that he used to think. This man on his way was on his way to persecute Christians. But when he woke up, all he wanted to do was help bring them to Jesus. So these are the things that we have to think about. Like when we're really shifting our vision, what are we seeing? What are, what are we truly seeing and whose lens are we truly operating out of? So, um, there is, um, there is something about Paul, um, that really stuck out to me. So he, he planted these churches he went to save, um, he used his life as a ministry, as a vessel to bring Gentiles um, to Christ. He was stoned, he was jailed, he was persecuted himself, and shit, like all of these things happened to Paul, but when you read in Philippians 3, he says, I once thought that the things that I value were of significance. But I know now that they truly mean nothing. It's trash or rubble compared to the glory of God. Like, it's nothing when you look at it through the lens of Christ. Everything that we see, everything that we're feeling, our jobs that we work so hard for, um, it's nothing. Our, the money in our bank is nothing. Like, the clothes in our closet are nothing. We work so hard to appear to be something for the eyes of man but when you look at it in the eternity perspective, it means nothing. The only thing that matters is what we are doing for Christ. The only thing that matters is that we are aligning our vision with what God has already ordained so that we can walk out in what he called us to be so that we can operate in his kingdom. That's the only thing that matters, that we are winning souls, that we are glorifying God, that we are bringing the knowledge of Jesus Christ to this earth. And then after we got, die from here, we are going to be with our father in eternity. So none of this actually matters. So why do we worry about it? Why do we stress? Why do we care about what people think about us? Like, why do we do that when God says, I've already ordained these things for you? Why are we worrying about what our, what our feelings are telling us to do? Why are we worrying about the fact that somebody hurt us or the fact that somebody um, betrayed us. Like these are the things that we truly, I can honestly say, get ready for it. Because if you really want to walk with God, there will be suffering. He, he kind of promised that you'll suffer. So like these are the things that we have to kind of get used to when we're really wanting to walk righteously with Jesus Christ. Um, so as I was pondering on this thing of like, of, of God, like ordaining our life before we were, um, formed. Um, I, I had to think about myself, you know, um, I had to, to evaluate my own vision and, um, and see myself as God saw me. So, um, I live, I, I lived, lived past tense because it's not me anymore, but I lived in this space where people labeled me as like shy and quiet. And it's some, some people even said I was stuck up because I just, you know, I, I kept to myself and I really didn't say much to anybody. But um, as I was thinking about this, and to be honest, like three, maybe four years ago, maybe last year, y'all probably never would have caught me up here, like in front of people talking. But the thing is, I had to realize that God had something ordained for me. Yeah. And, and he called me out of my box. He called me very clearly out of my bubble. And he said, don't call yourself shy. Like, no, I called you to stand boldly. I called you 
to be confident. I called you to be courageous. So honestly, I had to look up shy. So when you look up shy, the synonyms for shy are the synonyms for shy are um, timid, shrinking, withdrawn, fearful, hesitant, doubting, insecure, inconfident, repressed. How can you possibly walk in what God has called you to do if this is what you label yourself as? So no longer will I call myself shy because God did not call me to be shy. God called me to be courageous. I encourage you to no longer label yourself as shy. I encourage you to no longer label yourself as loud or no longer label yourself as stuck up or no longer label yourself as these things that people say that you are and start looking in your word to see what God has called that you are. And then this word quiet, this word quiet, you know, I tend to, you know, stick to myself. I truly don't say much to anybody unless somebody says anything to me. But like I said, God has called me out of that. So I had to start working on myself with the help of the Holy Spirit, because I can't do anything without the Holy Spirit, to push myself out of this box, to walk up to people that I normally wouldn't walk up to, to introduce myself or start a conversation with somebody that I would normally just look at you from across the room and Think about how cute your boots are. Like, I, I just wouldn't push myself to do these things no matter how much I wanted to. But when you look up this word, like when you when I thought about the word quiet and I'm praying on it, God's like, no, ma'am. No, ma'am. I called you to be bold. I called you to stand before people and declare that Jesus is Lord. I called, I called you to be a vessel to bring people into my kingdom. And there's no way that you can do that being quiet. So I'm going to need you to re rename yourself something else. I'm going to need you to identify with another word other than shy and quiet. So from now on, y'all, I'm bold. I'm courageous. I am fearless. And I'm standing on the things that God has called me to do. It's, it's crazy how we truly go through life. And we put ourselves in these boxes, y'all. We put ourselves in these boxes and we, we, we hammer, we hammer the door closed. Like we don't even let God in. We don't even give opportunity to be different. We don't give opportunity to be renewed in what God has called us to do. God says that you are a new creature, but if you are putting yourself in this box, where does the newness come from? How do you even get a hold of it? These are, we have to lean on the Holy Spirit, y'all. We cannot do anything of ourselves. We have to lean on the Holy Spirit and the Holy Spirit alone to get ourselves out of these boxes, to get ourselves even unshackled, even, even the sin that we've done ourselves. People are labeled, you know, because of their sin, but God says no more, no more. You are forgiven. That's not who you are. That's not what will make you. It may help you to save somebody else because you can tell them about your testimony, but that's not who you are. So don't claim that thing. Walk in something different. Walk in the newness of Christ that Christ has given you. So that is exactly what we have to do when we're seeing God, seeing the world, seeing ourselves, seeing other people through God's lenses. We have to lean on the Holy Spirit, which commands us to be humble. Humble, y'all. Do y'all humble? means lowering yourself, lowering yourself, bringing yourself down so that God can increase in your life. So everything that I've said before, all the feelings, all the, the thoughts and the emo like that doesn't matter when you're being humble. Nothing matters. It's putting yourself before God to say, you can have all of me. You created me. You can have all of me. You can use me for what you want to use me for. And I will say yes to you, Lord. That's what being humble is. Humbling ourselves unto God. Humbling ourselves to his direction. That when we see something on the news that may tweak something in our, in our minds to say, I should be angry about this. No, 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 no. What does God say about that thing? I'm not going to lead in hate because the news is telling me that I should hate. 
That's not what I'm going to do because my God says that I should love my neighbor. I'm not going to operate in, I'm not going to operate in fear because the news is telling me that I should operate in fear. That's not what I'm going to do. I'm going to see this thing for the way God sees it. And that's how I'm going to operate. And that's how I'm going to live my life according to God's kingdom. So when we're letting go of the things that make us feel secure, that make us feel secure, money, relationships, followers, this wall that we've built up to keep people out. It makes us feel safe, y'all. It makes us feel safe in that box that we hammered shut because nothing can get in, not even God, (laughs) not even God. So these are the things that we have to let go of because they will become idols in your life. They will become idols in your life. And it doesn't matter the size. It doesn't matter if it's just a little teeny tiny bit. Like, it doesn't matter. If you're putting it before God, it's an idol. So these are the things that we have to rid ourselves of. And like I said before, that we have to put in our peripheral vision as we're shifting God to the center focus of our view. Um, We have to admit that we are not our own. We have to be willing to be broken before God, meaning my pride, my insecurities, my fear, my self-doubt, All of these things we have to break ourselves of. We have to break ourselves of our own desires, of the flesh that wants to run our lives. We have to break ourselves from these things. The desires that tell us that I'd rather go out in the world and please myself rather than pleasing God. We often pray, Lord, have your way. But how many of us truly mean that? How many of us truly will allow God to have his way in our life? So me and my aunt were talking about this thing with women. I don't do women. Okay. But Lord, have your way with me. So you don't do women. Relationships with women, you know. And a woman walks in the church. And she's down. She needs a sister to help build her up. She needs encouragement. She needs prayer. She needs someone to help disciple her. But because you're so stuck in your perception of women in friendship relationships, you just look the other way. But Lord, have your way with me. How many times do we say have your way with me? And we really mean it. How many times do we say, Lord, have your way with me and are willing to push aside our notions, our thoughts, and our our feelings to actually operate in what he's trying to have his way with? I think that we have to come out of this, this thing with women because it's exactly what the enemy wants us to believe, that women are, are, are messy and women, um, are gossipers and women, you know, are backstabbers and women are just out to get you pretty much. Um, I think that we have to rid ourselves of this when we are in the kingdom, because I, I truly believe that when women are operating in unity, when women are operating under the authority of Jesus Christ, there is no stopping what a woman can do for the kingdom of God. When women are together praying for their husbands, there's no stopping what God can do. When women are together praying for their children, there's no stopping what God can do through those women. But with the enemy, he wants to keep us separated. He wants to keep us looking at each other through our our side eye, not allowing ourselves to be open, not allowing ourselves to be vulnerable, not allowing ourselves to actually get to know someone who could truly be a benefit to you. But because you're so stuck in your ways, because we are so stuck in our ways, we we cancel out our own blessings. We cancel out what God, that woman that God wanted to bring in your life to help you get to where he's trying to get you to. Because we don't want to open up our mind to, to be friendly to somebody, to pray with somebody, to lend out, a, to reach out a hand and say, if you need me, call me at two o'clock in the morning. I'll pray with you. 
We don't want to do that because we're, it's our own selfish desires. It's our own selfish mind that has us just so stuck in our boxes, not wanting to be vulnerable, which leads me to my third point, which is the optical illusions. These are the things that the enemy puts in our mind to make us believe that it's something that it's not. So an optical illusion can use color, light, and patterns to create images that can be deceptive or misleading to our brains. The information gathered by the eye is processed by the brain, creating a perception that in reality does not match the true image. If this is not Satan, <laughs> I don't know what is. He puts these images in our minds that gets us to believe that what we're seeing is the truth. 2 Corinthians 11 and 14 says, even Satan disguises himself as an angel of light. So that light that we're trying to let into our eyes, that, that lens that we've, we've put on our eyes that we're calling our God lens, the, the light of Jesus that we're trying to allow um, to get in through our our, our layers and our, our, our experiences and our perception, even Satan tries to come and disguise himself as light. So when we are looking at light, we have to realize that sometimes Satan can come and try to trick you with this illusion of something that seems like it's the truth when it's really not. So Satan will use our desires. He will use our selfish gain. He will use our insecurities, our fear. He will use our mistakes, our loneliness, our frustration, our experiences, and our weaknesses to change our perception of what we see, to get us to believe that it's actually the truth. He did it in the garden with Adam and Eve. He tried to do it with Jesus, but every time Satan came at Jesus, he just slapped him beside the head with the word of God. And that's exactly what we should be doing. Um, but... And, but in order to do these things, in order to rid ourselves of even the illusions of Satan, we have to truly continue to focus on God. Because the minute that we take ourselves off of God and start paying attention to the little things that are in our peripheral, paying attention to how much money is in my account, or paying attention to who hurt me today, or paying attention to the fact that I really don't feel like doing this today. When we start paying attention to the things that are in our peripheral instead of focusing on God, that's when Satan can sneak in with that illusion and trick our mind to believe that what we're seeing is truth. So some of Satan's illusions make us believe that something can be impossible. But God's word says that what is impossible with man is possible with God. Satan illusions can get you to believe that nobody cares about you because nobody's called to check on me this week. Nobody's called to see how I'm doing. But the word of God says, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. So if he's willing to give his only begotten son, he cares about you. Satan's illusion says that I'm afraid. I'm not going to step out and do this thing because I, I for what? I'm not going to step out and do what God has told me to do and walk in obedience because for what? But God's word says that he did not give us the spirit of fear. Satan's illusions have us believe that we are not enough. And this is one that's got me a lot, that I'm not enough. But when I look at the word of God, I know that God will supply all of my needs. Everything that I'm needing, everything that I think that I'm not, God makes up for. So these are the, the types of things that Satan will come and sneak into our mind to make us believe something that's not actually true. Or he'll have us even truly believing that our worth is found in how much money we make. Or our worth is found in what a man looks at us and says the compliments that he gives us. Or in the clothes that we wear. Or, or in the pictures that we post on Facebook that people like or don't like. He'll have us believing that our worth is wrapped up in these things when we all know that that's a lie. Um, so when we remember, we have to remember that things are not always what they seem. We're jaded. We have jaded perception, and we have to realize that. The sooner that we can realize that what we're seeing is not actually what it is, 
I think the, the sooner we can realize that we need to shift our perspective. The sooner that we realize that I can't trust my own feelings. <laughs> I think the sooner that we'll be willing to give it to God and look at it through his lens. The sooner that we realize these things, the more willing we'll be to give it to God and focus through his lens and his lens alone. So one of the other things that Satan, this is a big thing in our culture, y'all, that Satan uses is to do what makes you happy. I'm here today to tell you, don't do what makes you happy. Do what pleases God. Because what makes you happy today is not going to make you happy tomorrow. What makes you happy tomorrow will not make you happy next week. What makes you happy next week will not make you happy 10 years from now. But when you do what pleases God, I can testify that it, it brings happiness. It brings joy. It brings peace. It brings all these things that doing what made me happy would never bring in my life. I lived my life to do what made me happy. And the only thing that it brought me was heartache. The only thing that it brought me was lonely nights. The only thing that it brought me was ending up in an abortion clinic. The only thing that it brought me was all these things that left me shattered. It left me broken. It left me alone. It left me wondering who am I? All of these things that God had for me, I could not see because I was doing what made me happy. And when we do what makes us happy, where do we end up? When we, when we do what makes us happy, what does eternity look like for us? So the will of God is that not one is lost, but everybody is saved. Everybody comes into the knowledge of Jesus Christ. So his vision for you and for me is to help accomplish this this will for for his kingdom so when I say that we weren't put on this earth to make us happy I mean that we were put on this earth to accomplish the will of our father so the vision that he has for you to write that book like I said earlier to run that company to start that nonprofit organization to raise your children is not for you it's to bring glory to God's kingdom it's to advance his kingdom. It's to bring people into the knowledge of Jesus Christ. It's to glorify God. That is the reason that we were put on this earth. That is a vision that God has for each one of us that will accomplish his will. So when we begin to think that I was put on this earth to make me happy, we will be living a life full of disappointment. We will be living a life full of unhappiness, sadness, like I said, brokenness, all these things, because we aren't walking in the purpose that God has for us. But as my husband said earlier, when we're walking in our purpose, you feel fulfilled. You feel worth something. You feel like you are actually doing something for God something valuable for God, something that he can be pleased with, something that he can look down and smile and say, good job, daughter. I don't know about you guys, but when I come to the end of my life, I don't want to get to, the, to God and look at him face to face and say, well, Lord, I did what made me happy. Okay. I don't know about you, but I don't want to end my life living in the way that made me happy. I want to do what pleases God. And when we live to please God, these are the things that allow us to manifest what he has ordained for us in our life. So there is actually a benefit beyond this place. There's a benefit of eternity. There's a benefit of riches in heaven that we store up while we're here on earth. So the more that we focus on our own desires, on our own flesh, and on our own selfish gain, how do we actually use how do we actually use those things to build up riches in heaven? We can't. We have to operate in the kingdom. We have to operate how God has ordained, and we have to operate according to God's word. So I want to 
let you know that it won't truly be easy because there's suffering, there are trials, and there are things that will continue to break you, continue to get you closer and closer to the vision that God has for you. There are things that will bring persecution to you when you choose to do things according to God's word. People will persecute you. Um, people will laugh at you. People will look at you like you're crazy. But these are the things that we can't be concerned with because our, our, our vo- focus is on God. Our focus is doing what pleases God. So 2 Corinthians 4 and 18 says, we do not look at the troubles we can see now. Rather, we fix our gaze on the things that cannot be seen. For the things we see now will be gone. And the things we cannot see will last forever. So let's not live in this life and miss the whole point. Let's not live in this life walking around blindly satisfying ourselves instead of focusing on the vision that God has for us. The vision that God wants to manifest in each and every one of our lives. Like I said earlier, God has already ordained that thing for you. So what are you going to do so that he can begin to check those things out of his cart? Will you walk in the obedience that he has called you to? Will you give up that thing that he's telling you to give up? Will you check your fear and your anger and your issues at the door? What, what are you willing to give up in order to get what God has manifest, to get what God has ordained for you so that these things can manifest in your life? I have um, year, years and years and years ago, it was prophesied to me that um, I would be a leader and that I would be a teacher. But I was still in the world. So I looked at it from a worldly perspective. And what I did instead of seeking God is I started seeking degrees. <laughs> I went and enrolled myself in education courses. <laughs> and the only thing that it did was made me lose time it made me lose money and it kind of made me wonder like, what am I doing? Like it was no satisfaction in this whatsoever. I went to these classes and I'm like, what is like, this is what you wanted me to do God? Like, what is this? But it's so crazy because I was, I was in my mind, I was seeking my purpose. I would pray and pray and pray, God, what is it that you want for me? What is my purpose on this earth? But I was still living in sin. I was praying for my purpose, but I wasn't doing what it took to walk in my purpose. I was praying for God to show me his vision, but I was still looking at things from my perspective. But when I decided to truly live for Christ and I decided to truly give myself and everything that I have in order to serve him and be a servant unto him, then he started to download his vision into my life. He started giving me glimpses of things that were for me. And when I first saw it, I'm like, "Uh, uh -uh. uh-uh, uh-uh, that ain't me. But he started to download these things in my mind until it came to a point to where I had to say, okay, God, if this is what you want for me, yes, Lord. If this is what you want for me, for me and my husband to start where's way, yes, Lord. If this is what you want for me, to have church in my living room on Sunday morning. Yes, Lord. If this is what you want from me to give when we don't have anything. Yes, Lord. Like these are the things that God is calling us to do, to say yes, to surrender ourselves, to surrender our will, to surrender our way, to surrender all of these things that we think make us who we are, to surrender them and say, yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. When are you going to say yes to the Lord? When are you going to say yes to see the things that he has ordained for you manifesting in your life? That's what it's going to take. That's what you have to do. So when we are talking about purpose, when we're talking about rising up as kingdom women, we cannot negate the fact that we first have to say yes. We first have to walk in what God has called us to do in order to be able to operate in the kingdom, in order to say that I am a kingdom woman and I am going to arise, we have to have already said yes. 
So I encourage you today to look at the things in your life that you've been holding on to. Look at the things in your life that you're not really ready to give up. Look at the things in your life that create this perception of the world in your, in your mind. Look at those things and evaluate. Give yourself an eye exam. Do a heart check on yourself to say, what can I give to you, God? What is it that you're asking me for that I can say yes to? If you're truly wanting to see what God has for you manifest in your life. So as I come to a close, I really, um, I truly, truly hope that you guys can look, like I said, look at your life, put it through a lens, put it through this lens right here. This is the standard. This is the standard that we have to go, that we have to, um, live our lives according to the, this is the rule. This is the standard. And this is what we have to continually compare our lives to. So if this is what you're doing on this side and it doesn't line up with this, get rid of it. If what you're saying over here does not align with what God is saying, get rid of it. If what you see on TV is not lining up with what God is saying, get rid of it. Don't even allow it to process in your mind. Don't allow it to create images in your, in, your, in, your, in your eyes. Don't allow that. If what you're listening to does not align up with what God is saying, get rid of it. These are the things that hold us back from the vision that God has for us. These are the things that hold us back from the purpose that God has called us to. The things over here are the things that will lead us to destruction, our own selfish gain, that will lead us to sin, that will lead us to doing things according to the way that we want to do them. So if you're lining yourself up and you're trying to get your focus right, you're trying to align yourself up with God and it's not lining up with what the word of God is saying, then get rid of it. I can say simple as that, but it takes work. It takes discipline. It takes accountability. So that woman that you eyed when she walk in the door because you don't do women, grab her up. Tell her that I need you. You need me. And we're going to hold, our, hold ourselves accountable to what God says. Get you a prayer partner. Get you somebody that you can hold accountable and they can hold you accountable. So when you are doing something because of your own perception and your own experience that you don't even recognize, when the enemy has illusions in front of your face, your friend can tap you on the shoulder and say, no, ma'am, it's not lining up with the word of God. These are the things that we need in our life. These are the people that we need in our life. If you have friends that are not lining up with the word of God, get rid of them. Not saying that you can't, you know, help them become closer to Christ. But you have to create, you have to create a barrier. You have to create something that will keep your vision on God and God alone. He should be first in our life in everything that we do. If we keep reading um, in Matthew, keep reading Matthew 6.33. We all know that, right? Seek ye first the kingdom of God. He wants to be first in your life. Everything else he wants to see doesn't matter. Continue to focus on God and continue to keep everything else in the peripheral. As we continue doing this, God will continue, God will begin to download those visions in your head of what he's already ordained. God will continue to allow you to see what you can be if you trust in him five years down the road. Continue to put God first. Continue to keep God in your center view and continue to remember that nothing else matters when it comes to eternity. Everything else is temporary. So if we can do that, then we'll walk in kingdom. We'll walk according to his principles and we can truly call ourselves kingdom women and kingdom men because we're walking according to God's principles. So that is all I have for today. I pray that you guys continue to seek God, continue to put him first because nothing else matters. Hallelujah. Can y'all clap for the first?